Hello, my name is Evan Bullion. I'm a PhD student under Greg Caparaso at NAU. I'm also a research software engineer and one of the lead developers of the Chime 2 project. Um, today we're going to be talking about ANCOM. And to do that, we're going to start with me kind of drawing out a sketch of what's going on with a pretty simple example. And then we're going to return to the tutorial and follow that. So suppose we have two samples. So we have sample one and we have sample two. And within these samples, we have features. So we have features A, B, C, and so on, all the way through F. Similarly, in sample two, we have the same six features all the way to F. And if we're interested in differential abundance, we might be interested in how, say, feature A in sample one changes in sample two. And so let's suppose that feature A actually increases in sample two. Well, a consequence of this is all of the other features in sample two must decrease. And I'll explain why that is in a second. Similarly, if sample two's feature A were to actually decrease instead, then that would mean that all of the other features in sample A, sample two, must increase. So the key to understanding this behavior is each sample has its own sequencing depth. And so sample one, I'm going to say the sequencing depth is in one. Similarly for sample two, it is in two. And so what this means is that all of our features, so let's say feature A plus feature B and so on up until feature F, which is our last feature, must equal that sequencing depth. And the same thing is true of sample two over here. So if we were to increase A just like before, that means in order to still equal in two, so this is still in two, we have to decrease all of the other terms in order for that equality to still be the case. And so we tend to not think about this too much because these sequencing depths are something we generally don't control. So they're kind of random, but they do exist. And so our data is constrained by the sequencing depth of our sample. So if we wanted to compare feature A in sample one with feature A in sample two, we have a slight challenge because all of these features are related to their unrelated sequencing depths. So a trick we can use is we can see the frequency of feature A as really being the proportion of A times that depth. So these are equal. And if we look at it this way, we realize that when we take the ratio of something, so let's say, um, Let's say we have the proportion of A times its depth over the proportion of, let's say, feature D times its depth. Well, since these are the same term, they just cancel out. And so we can just say that is equal to the ratio of feature A over um, feature D. And so we can use this to understand change between our samples, which is independent of these sequencing depths. And so over here, we can say something similar. We can say, what is FA over FD? And now we have something we can compare between the two because we've canceled out that sequencing depth. Now, there's one last thing we might want to address. And that's that the comparison of feature A over feature D is not going to be the same as the comparison of feature D over feature A. And that's maybe not so desirable, but it's a pretty easy thing to fix. So if we take the log of this, so if we say the log of that, well, now the log of the other side is simply its inverse. So we can say that is the negative log of this. 
And so this is basically our log ratio. And it's what most compositional uh, methods are based on. So if we return to our community, we know we're interested in some kind of ratio. And so we want to know how maybe the ratio between um, feature A and D changes in sample 1 compared to um, F versus D in sample 2. And so something we can do is set up a pretty simple ANOVA. And so we can say that our equation looks like um, the log of FA over FD. And we're going to have some intercept. We're going to have some beta for sample 1. And we'll have some residual as well for 1. And so then we can do the same thing on the other side. So we'll have the log of FA in sample 2 over FD. And we'll have, again, that global intercept. And then the effect of sample 2. So that'll be our beta 2. And then again, some epsilon, which is our error. So now we have something we can test. So we can ask the question, is beta 1, the effect of sample 1, different from beta 2, the effect of sample 2? And so if they're the same, then that means that this ratio in sample 1 has not really changed in sample 2. So there's not really a difference here. But if they are different, um, then that means that we have some kind of significantly different ratio. So we have a differentially abundant ratio. Um, and so that's pretty handy, but it's still a ratio. So we don't know whether or not we can pin the blame on feature A or feature D. We just know the ratio between them has changed. So I've now combined those two communities, and we're going to talk about it in terms of just the features. So if we're interested in, say, feature A to D, if this edge is significant, that means in sample 1, this comparison uh, has a different beta than in sample 2. So let's suppose it is significant. And let's assume that the difference in beta 2 compared to beta 1 is negative. Well, that either implies that F feature D has increased, or it could also be the case that feature A has decreased. We can't really tell those apart. But Anacom has one more trick, and that is to do all of the comparisons. So if we were to test feature A against feature B, feature C against feature A, feature A against E, A against F, and then likewise over on D, make those same comparisons. So D to B, D to C, D to E, and D to F we can try and determine which of these is more significant. So let's suppose that over here in feature um, D, we find the comparison is significant, 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 and significant. However, when we look at feature A, only the connection to feature D was significant. And so who do we think is actually differentially abundant here? Well, odds are pretty good it's going to be feature D. And so if we count up these significant edges, that's going to be our W score. And so here we have a W of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we'd say the W of feature D is 5, whereas the W of feature A is only 1. And if we do that for all comparisons, against every single um, feature, so I draw out this crazy graph, we will have kind of a network and a distribution of W scores. And so with a W of 5, that's basically as good as you're going to get. Um, this is the theoretical maximum for six features. But maybe we'll see a W of 4 or maybe a W of 3. And so what we want to do is look at the distribution of these Ws, because we're going to expect it will be bimodal. There will be some Ws, so some set of features, where the W is awfully high, 
and then others where it's really not that high, so it'll be low. And that's how we're going to identify which features are actually differentially abundant and in what direction. Okay, so I have the tutorial up here now, and so you should make sure that you scroll to the section Differential Abundance with ANCOM. So one of the first steps we're going to do is we're actually going to filter some features out. So I'm going to copy this command, and I'm going to go over to my console, and I'm going to make sure I'm inside of Workshop Mouse Tutorial, and I am going to paste that in. Oh my goodness. I wasn't expecting it to copy right then. So I'm going to come back over here, I'm going to copy, and I'm going to paste it in. So I'm going to hit Enter. And what this is going to do is it's going to take our table 2K. So this is a feature table where all of the samples have at least 2,000 features. And we're going to add an additional refinement. So we're going to drop features, um, which are either seen less than 50 times or in um, less than four samples. And if we wanted to fully understand um, the definition of that, so whether it's inclusive or exclusive, we can test that by typing chime feature table, uh, filter features, help. And so we can see the definitions of these things. All right, so now that I have that, I'm going to return to the tutorial, and we're going to talk about why we might want to do that. So. One thing to realize about ANCOM is, since we're testing for differential abundance, it's more useful if the features we're testing that with are actually present in multiple samples. Otherwise, there's really not the opportunity for those to be differentially abundant at all. You'll really just get differential presence absence. And it'll be on features which probably aren't very important because they're either rare members or um, just noise outright. So that's kind of the, the goal here. Um, and now, scrolling down a little bit, we're going to do another step. And so this is chime composition, add pseudo count. And so what a pseudo count is, is it's a way of kind of getting around the fact that you cannot really divide by zero. Um, and even if you could, taking the log of zero is also no good. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a small number to every single observation. So where we would have seen a zero in our in our table, so for some sample and some feature, there is just a zero because we didn't observe it, we're going to pretend we did observe it, but only like once. And so that's what this command is going to do. And so essentially what we're doing is we are saying that we have made an observation of almost everything. Um, and so that's going to help us actually take these log ratios. And so we're going to assume that every zero is not necessarily a structural zero. Um, rather, it's more of a measurement zero, where our resolution was just too poor. So if we had sequenced deeper, maybe we would have observed something. And so we're just assuming we've observed at least one thing so that we can take a log ratio. It's not the most elegant way to approach this, um, but it does work. Um, yeah, I, I do hope that in the future we come up with some better strategies for this, um, but zero is a real problem with compositional methods. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do um, in ANCOM is we are going to analyze by donor. So we're going to ask the question, so we have these samples, right? We're going to ask the question, are the samples whose donor are um, healthy versus those with Parkinson's disease, is there a change in any of the log ratios? And is there enough of a systemic bias in for one feature? So it's causing many log ratios to be significantly different that we would believe that that OTU or that feature is the cause of it. Maybe not the cause of it, but the um, the reason that we see a differentially abundant feature at all. So the the reason for the differentially abundant ratio. Um, so I'm going to hit enter, 
And so this is going to take a little bit to run because it is doing all pairwise comparisons um, between these groups. You'll notice we also ran in that same command um, a test against genotype. So we're, now we're asking the question, um, does the predisposition of the mouse to kind of our Parkinson's model um, cause a difference in any of the OTUs that we uh, observe? And so what we have now are two QZVs. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to um, workshop server dot chime two dot org slash my username which happens to be astute lobster because I thought that sounded cool and you're gonna see quite quite many more uh, files I only grabbed the files I needed for this tutorial uh, which is why there's so few but the things we're interested in are ancom donor and ancom genotype so let's maybe take a look at donor first so I'm gonna copy the link address and I'm going to go to view.chime2.org. I'm going to select file from the web. I'm going to paste that in. And we're going to run. And so the first thing we see is kind of this very interesting plot. So this is called a volcano plot. And when I was talking about the W scores, so the number of comparisons which were deemed significant for the test we ran, um, I said that we'd see kind of a distribution. And so what we're seeing here is that distribution of W scores. And so what we want to do is find those values which are most extreme. Um, and so there's maybe not a perfect cutoff point here, but it's pretty safe to say that this feature here, which has a very high value of W, is probably more differentially abundant than something down here, which is probably only has a W score of 28 because some other features changed, changing that guy's ratio. Um, now on the x-axis, we have basically the effect. So you'll see CLR here, and that is the centered log ratio. And so this is a way to aggregate basically the impact of that one feature against the rest of the community. So we're interested in features that not only um, seem to be uh, awfully suspicious in the number of times they have been found in a differential, uh, differentially abundant ratio, but also those that have an unusually large effect relative to the um, average, which is all the CLR is telling us. So W is basically the, um, not exactly the significance, but the importance of that feature, and C the x-axis is the effect. So down here we see a table kind of explaining the same thing. And so ANCOM has chosen essentially all of these features um, as being differentially abundant. And this is um, the donor group. So these are features that we think have systematically changed between um, the healthy control donors and the Parkinson's donors. We can also look at um, percentiles for these two groups. So we have healthy control and Parkinson's donor. Whoops. So um, you'll notice at the zeroth percentile, we have these ones. Remember that is artificial. Uh, we had an imputation step where we added a pseudo count. So every one you see here is actually a zero deep down. Um, and then we have the 25th percentile. And so now we see um, 427. If we look over in the Parkinson's, it looks like this maybe isn't differentially abundant so much as it is differentially present. But that's still interesting. Let's see if we can find a nice differentially abundant one. Um, I suppose this one's okay. So over here we do have a feature which is pretty rare it looks like. Um, and it's found more in the Parkinson's group. So this is indeed differential abundance. Um, just looking through here, here's a better one. Um, so this one has some actual observations. Um, again, relatively rare in the healthy control. Um, and also actually pretty rare in the Parkinson's group. But we are detecting, you know, an actual difference in its abundance. So that, that's kind of what this visualization is showing us. If we look at the other one, 
So going back over to uh, the workshop server, I'm going to look at genotype because we already looked at donor. So I'm going to, nope, not that. I am going to copy the link address. I'm going to go to view view.chime2.org file from the web. I'm going to paste that in. And that's the ANCOM genotype. And so here we're going to see kind of a pretty extreme change, right? So most of our um, values, even if they have like a pretty reasonable effect size given the range of our data, um, really don't seem to be um, separating themselves in terms of all the log ratios that we are comparing. Um, something that does kind of stand out are these two. And you'll have to excuse me, that is my cat. Um, she hears me talking and really wants to understand what's going on. So we see this split in distribution that um, is kind of what we're looking for. And so we see these three features that ANCOM selected. So that would be these top three. And we can see um, this first one actually is really nice. So we have some real observations of it in the susceptible group. So we're looking at genotype now. So this is our mouse model. And then also actual observations of it in our wild type. But ANCOM has identified this as an actually differentially abundant feature. Um, these last two appear to be more of a presence absence kind of thing. So we have some observations in the wild type. And again, really nothing going on here. So if we go back to the tutorial, we can think about these questions. So the first question is, are there more differentially abundant features between the donors or the mouse genotype? Um, so if we look at this, um, we see donor has a great many features that are differentially abundant and genotype less so. And the question prompts us, do we expect this given beta diversity? So if we remember um, some of the visualizations we looked at before, so I'm just scrolling up here to take a look at um, beta group significance would be pretty good. Um, I want donor significance. So let's look at that one. And then not seeing a very exciting one for I might cut this out of the video. We'll see. All right, so we have the donor significance, and we see um, there does appear to be kind of like a difference happening here, right? Um, we have a p-value that looks pretty good. Visually, it seems convincing enough. And so if we look at our donor, I think that's recapitulated given the number of features that are really different here. And so if we have a lot of features that are differentially abundant, we would expect that the distances between these two groups might be a little bit higher with beta diversity. All right, the next question is, here we are. Are there any features that are differentially abundant in both the donors and by genotype? So let's, let's take a look at that. And the way I'm gonna do that is I am going to search the small set against the large set. So I'm just going to type that in, and Chrome says there's no results for that. I'm going to do the same thing here. And just to remind people what these crazy strings are, they are um, a hash of the sequence. So basically, we've taken the full uh, sequence of this section of 16S, and we've kind of mushed it up into this little uh, string, which is much simpler to look at. This is called a hash. Um, it's not compression because we have actually lost some information here, but not in a way that actually matters in practice. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to search. And so we see that there really aren't any shared features between these. So it looks like donor and genotype are completely independent effects. Okay. So... The next question is, how many differentially abundant features are there between the two genotypes? Um, and are they more abundant in the wild type or susceptible? Fortunately, the genotype's the simple one. 
and we kind of went over this. So for the most part, it seems that the wild type um, has the higher abundance because these two were just differentially present. This one was differentially abundant. And we can also see that the um, effect of this was 2.4. So I don't like thinking about log odds, which is kind of what this is. So I'm not going to stew on that too much. But we can see it's a pretty good effect, and it's positive. So we have more in the comparison of susceptible against wild type. OK, and the last question. Use taxonomy, metadata visualization, and search sequence identifiers for the significantly different features by genotype. What genera do they belong to? So I'm actually going to leave that as an exercise for you guys, um, because it's important to be able to kind of think about these things. But I will give you a hint. So the taxonomy metadata visualization we generated up here a little bit. So we have our taxonomy bar chart. Um, and over here, we have a tabulate seeks, or sorry, not tabulate seeks, tabulate metadata. So here, we're using the taxonomy file as metadata and producing that visualization. So I'm just going to look at that. And so you can imagine, you can actually search those differentially abundant features. And you could look at these and try and understand, is there any kind of like taxonomic interpretation for these features. So basically, do we interpret these as amplicon sequence variants, or is there some more general pattern we can identify using taxonomy? So that's basically all there is to it. Um, thank you for listening, and hopefully this was helpful.